Uh, so for our next uh, set of presentations, we're going to focus on uh, uh, funding your conservation and funding your uh, agriculture. So, so far we've talked about private solutions, things like bringing hunting onto your uh, property, looking at carbon markets and other natural capital markets. But we also want to focus on grants and how you can get access to those because those are another important uh, pool of funding you can do to unlock the potential of your ranches. So I'll hand it up. We have folks from the NRCS here as well as Josh from uh, Good Agriculture, which is a private company that helps ranchers with grant writing. So again, you know, again, together these things can really help unlock that funding for ranchers. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Terry asked us to come here and talk about programs, and we all know how simple government programs are, so this should be a piece of cake. Uh, I'm Ted Nelson, I'm with NRCS in Livingston. This is uh, Cody Garcia and Nate Brown, they're also in the Livingston office. So uh, some of this is not going to be easy to talk about in just a few minutes, so I, I'd recommend one-on-one -on -one with us or whatever county you happen to be. All right. So. Here's kind of some of the general ones. We'll go to the top first. Uh, EQIP, is, that's been our main financial assistance program for some time now. It's an environmental quality incentive program. There's a lot of different arms to that, which we'll get into in part later on. Uh, RCPP is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. That's another one that's actually active now in Park County. It's not everywhere, it, it's outside entities come together with a, or propose a uh, project and you know they're ranked and vetted and all that sort of thing and certain ones across the country get approved I think there's maybe two in the state right now something like that maybe a couple more um, CSP is the conservation stewardship program that one is in, aimed at uh, ag producers who are, are already at a high level of conservation and want to go even higher it has potential, it's, I'll say it's been difficult to get into in this area to get a contract lately, so we don't have any of those going right now, but there's potential there. CRP, uh, that is not an NRCS program, it's a farm service agency. Uh, there's a general CRP, which most people are aware of, it's putting highly erodible cropland back into perennial vegetation. But there's also a, a newer uh, category of CRP called CRP grasslands. That could be more appropriate to ranchers. It's, it's where you can put any sort of grazing land or <coughs> inland forage producing acres into a, a conservation program of 10 or 15 years. You can get uh, eventually some assistance with water development and uh, uh, fencing. And it gives you an annual uh, per acre payment for those years. So it's becoming more popular, I'd say, in Montana. Uh, something to consider. We could talk about it more with you or FSA could. Um, CTA is Conservation Technical Assistance. That's kind of our non-financial uh, program that we operate under. And then over here on the other side, there's all the easement uh, programs and that gets really complex. At a field office level, we're not really uh, into that seriously. It's a different staff at the state office that handles those. But there's agricultural conservation easement program. Under that is AL, which is agricultural land easement, um, WRE, which is wetland reserve easement, and there's HFRP, healthy forest reserve program, um, and REF. I don't even know what that stands for. It's part of, it's part of the, the wetland reserve program. So they're uh, actually the, one of the programs with RCPP involves easement. And I think Cody will talk about that more a little later. So I'll start off with conservation technical assistance. This was kind of the backbone of NRCS and SCS, Soil Conservation Service, what we used to be called for over 50 years. That is where we go out, use our, our own expertise, or bring in um, area or state office experts, you know, range specialists, soil scientists, foresters, biologists, agronomists, economists, you know, whatever that we needed to solve a, uh, or to develop a conservation plan. But we, we always do this with any application. It starts out with conservation technical assistance because we want to develop a conservation plan with the producer. Um, Matt kind of talked about it. We like to talk to the people first, find out what their goals are, what their concerns are on the land. We do our inventory. We come up with a mutually agreeable conservation plan and then see if that can roll into a financial assistance program. So 
we use it all the time, but it's not quite the standalone program like it was in the early days. Uh, NRCS has become a lot more funding dominated. So that's what people come, have come to expect, and that's mostly what we're working with. So I will let Jody take over now. So we'll get into too much detail here because I'm not actually that well versed with the entirety of the IRA, but I wanted to make a point to throw it in here because at least where it pertains to the USDA moving forward, this is really going to drive uh, sort of the direction that we're going in, uh, kind of like what Ted is alluding to, uh, becoming more uh, financially uh, assistance driven. So I just want to clarify that the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, because there's been a little bit of confusion around this, it's not a new USDA program. It's actually a bill that was just recently passed in the legislation, uh, and a, a piece of that is essentially providing the USDA and other entities with an influx of additional funding. So since 1985, the majority of our funding has actually come from the Farm Bill. So now we have moving forward funds available from the Farm Bill and the IRA. Where most of those funds uh, will be seen is gonna come through, you can see the graphic, EQIP, CSP, ASAP, which so I don't know what that means. It's, a, it's alphabet soup all the way down. <laughs> but basically, uh, they're putting the funds that we're receiving from the IRA uh, towards climate smart ag and forestry, is what they're calling it. Uh, and so that can be seen in any number of programs, like uh, under EQIP, and Nate will talk about the community agriculture program here in a little bit. What a lot of those climate smart ag and forestry practices are, uh, they have a focus on, you know, kind of like what the uh, the main goal, you know, what we're all coming together to talk about today is essentially practices that will help with carbon sequestration, uh, carbon storage in the soil. So in forest lands, you know, we're looking at forest land improvement. We're actually, you know, we have some uh, thinning practices uh, and as well as on rangelands, we have uh, grazing management. And it's gonna talk a little bit about the eco program. <laughs> So EQIP is the uh, kind of bread and butter of NRCS. It's the main program, especially for financial assistance and any uh, land management objectives that you might have. Um, it's gonna work a little bit differently in all states. Here in Montana, we have something called uh, Focus Conservation, which Cody will discuss here in a couple minutes, but uh, uh, Every state's is set up a little bit different in the, on how they operate with the, with this, and so it's best, like Ted mentioned, to kind of talk to your local office, see what is available, um, and and see what best options they have to help you out with any financial assistance. Uh, the community ag um, in 2021 it was kind of started um, national priority uh, called urban agriculture. Uh, here in Montana, urban agriculture didn't really fit, so we kind of recoined it and call it uh, community ag. Basically, if you're providing uh, food or fiber to your local county, you can qualify for this fund pool. Um, and within this, it opens up our whole suite of practices uh, to, to use to address any resource concern that you may have. Um, here in Montana, primarily what we've seen here in Park County, um, a lot of high tunnels, um, small scale grazing operations, putting a grazing plant on five to 10 acre pieces, um, uh, shelter belts, livestock, waters, uh, drinking tanks, you know, kind of the whole suite of grazing practices um, with that. Um, with the high tunnels, you know, those are kind of going in to extend um, growing seasons. Um, I think they kind of started to address what was, uh, what we were calling food deserts. Um, I don't think that term kind of exists or isn't really being used anymore, but um, that's kind of where this got its start. And um, small fun pool available, so it is pretty competitive, but Anyone in the county, regardless of focus conservation that we have in Montana, can come into the office and put in an application for uh, the community ag program.
RCPP. So the Regional Conservation Partnership Program is sort of a deal where, through EQIP, we provide funding to other land trust entities uh, to provide farmers and ranchers with the opportunity to put their ground into conservation easements. Uh, and we're pretty hands off with the easement side of things, but it's a partnership between us and that land trust, uh, whoever is administering the funds for this program. But within that, we also have funds available to participate in uh, a program. You know, we're, we're administering our RCPP uh, in the southern half of Park County uh, with equal dollars. And uh, whenever we create uh, this program in agreement with the land trust, we kind of set whatever the practices uh, are going to be available to producers that work with us on our side of things. So I think for you know our uh, RCPP in the southern half of the county, uh, we have a lot of assistance available for similar things uh, like what Ted might talk about for the NWQI uh, National Water Quality Initiative. We have practices available to assist with resource concerns on animal feeding operations. It doesn't have to meet the definition of the classic feedlot. It could just be growls, uh, where you're feeding out cattle uh, next to home place in the winter. We also have uh, practices that help address uh, wind and water erosion, stream make stabilization, things like that. Uh, and mainly with this, we're focusing on uh, grazing management and infrastructure. Okay, so the National Water Quality Initiative has been around NRCS for quite a while, at least 15 years, and selectively doing watersheds across the country not really a certain focus on it, but uh, we did a lot of corrals on streams like in Stillwater County when I was there. We did about 40 of them, getting them off the stream. But in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, there was a lot of emphasis placed on drinking water, so-called source water problems. I think Flint, Michigan was one of the headliners there. So that Farm Bill directed that we spend at least 10% of our equip dollars on source water problem. So each state was tasked with determining where their priority source water areas were. And the Shields River Valley in Northern Park County was one of those priority areas because they had a documented high level of nitrates in their public drinking water in Clyde Park and Hill South. So we, we put in for this NWQI money and we got it. And uh, we're right now accepting applications for our third and final year. And it's really to reduce, do practices that reduce the, uh, the amount of nitrates in the water at, from an agricultural source. So we can do a lot of things with this. It can be irrigation efficiency, again, getting uh, crowds off of streams. It can be soil health. It can be cropping systems, um, grazing systems. You know, so we reduce the, the erosion from uplands and the carrying of waste from uplands. It's been very popular. Um, We've done a variety of things. You know, we did some cover crops and like 700 and some acres on this one producer's place and it's been very successful. Uh, but that one, again, it, it runs out as far as applying this year. So if you're from that area, you've got land there and you want to talk about it, come on in. We can accept applications until late October, maybe the 27th. But it's been a good program. Uh, I'd be sad to see it go. So we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, uh, we do things a little bit differently in Montana. So for those of you that are visiting from other states, um, you know, go in and talk to your local office. They're gonna do things completely different than how we do it here. But at least in the state of Montana, we have what we call focus conservation. And so the intent of focus conservation is to uh, get conservation on the ground, you know, in such a way that it's locally led. It goes to local work groups. We have watershed groups uh, here in Park County. I think we have two that are part of uh, Park Conservation District. We have the Shields uh, Watershed Group and the Upper Yellowstone uh, Watershed Group. And so uh, it's kind of an interesting point there um, because for us, you know, when we go to these groups, they're made up of all kinds of government agencies, NGOs, uh, but primarily landowners, farmers and ranchers. And so we go to these groups and we ask them what their priorities are, what their concerns are, what do they see in their part of the county. Um, and that's a, that's a huge thing for us at two watershed groups in Park County because you see vastly different land uses, vastly different compositions uh, of the community, 
and what they're concerned with and what the challenges they're faced with. So, you know, the Shields, uh, you have a lot more traditional farms and ranchers, uh, whereas in Paradise Valley, of course, there's a lot more small uh, tract owners, which is where we see a lot of traction gain with this community ag program. Uh, it kind of opens up the door for folks with, you know, maybe only 10 or 20 acres, uh, sometimes even less, to actually be able to, to do something to provide uh, food and fiber uh, to themselves, to their communities. But we go to these groups, we get the priorities, we rank them against the resource concerns, and you know, we break out um, the resource concerns into different categories, whether it be soil, water, air, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we come up with this long-range plan, uh, initially whenever we first implemented uh, focus conservation. And from this long-range plan and from continued meetings with these watershed groups, uh, that kind of guides uh, where our focus is uh, moving forward, you know, looking the next couple of years ahead. And so we do uh, what we call targeted implementation plans. So we identify whatever the top priority is uh, for the next couple of years moving forward from the watershed groups, and then we, you know, sit down and we kind of get together and think about what we can actually do to address those concerns. Um, and we identify, you know, the highest concentration of uh, said resource concerns. You know, like for the for the National Water Quality Initiative, it's a little different because it came down from the national level. Um, you know, but in the past, we had a targeted implementation plan for herbaceous wheat treatment in Paradise Valley. Uh, that was the biggest concern amongst both uh, large farms and ranches and small tract owners near uh, HOAs. And so uh, we put together um, this program for a couple of years, and I think we, we actually just, uh, that was our, yeah, this is our last year. So yeah, no, no more signups for that. Um, but anyway, I think yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the tip that we have coming up if you want to move. So um, this is kind of a mouthful. It's a, the Trail Creek Watershed Climate Resiliency Tip. Um, and this is because uh, you know, we want climate resiliency instead of conifer encroachment or something like that because what this program is about is working on both uh, forest and rangeland uh, because in this area here, this is the Trail Creek Watershed. It includes a couple other uh, sub-drainages too. You've got Strickland Creek in there. Uh, this is the county line between Park and Gallatin, uh, and then so you've got Canyon Mountain up there uh, to Goldman Creek, and that's uh, I-90. So it's pretty much everything south of the interstate down to where Trail Creek runs into Dry Creek uh, on the west side of Paradise Valley. Um, so this came from a meeting with uh, obviously the Upper Yellowstone Watershed Group. Their you know their their priorities were with uh, wheat pressure, but not just you know, herbaceous weeds, not just weeds. Uh, to them, you know, they were considering conifers as weeds because we have a lot of acres in here. I think this is like a 110,000 acre area, uh, you know, which was primarily rangeland. So you, this, you look at this ortho imagery here, uh, this aerial, I think it was from 2019 or 2020, something like that. You see a lot of green in there, which is the, the tree cover, uh, especially on those ridges, Canyon Mountain, Antelope Butte, uh, the Hogback. You look at imagery from 1985, even, uh, and a lot of that is bare ground, or not bare ground, but uh, free of trees. Um, so we put this tip together uh, to treat you know, the, the historic forest, going in and doing forest and improvement practices, uh, but really focusing in on that rangeland and trying to um, reverse that conifer encroachment and then go in where we remove the conifers and implement uh, grazing infrastructure and grazing management practices to try to build a, a, a more resilient landscape. Okay, so we'll be available for questions. We're all gonna be on the tour tomorrow too if you wanna talk about any of these things. Uh, if you're local, come into the office, we can visit. I know it's confusing, it's really confusing when you try to explain our, our programs. A lot of people don't care where the what programs it's called or whatever, just so the money comes. <laughs> yeah, that's most important to them. But uh, anyway, give us a little time if you got questions. So I'm Josh. I'm the funding lead for uh, Good Agriculture. And before I dive in, I just wanted to have a, a sort of a point of clarification. We work nationwide, but we are based out of. Uh, Georgia and, and the southeast is it's, it's a very different place for lots of reasons we grow lots of different kinds of forage and you know out here we have a stocking rate of one cow per one to one and a half acre um, also 
most all agricultural producers, even if they're just raising cattle and forage, refer to themselves as farmers, not ranchers. But for the purpose of this presentation, you can use farmers and ranchers pretty much interchangeably. Uh, so the mission statement for good agriculture, great farmers should farm and leave the indoor activities to us. Um, we, the company was started when the founder had first-hand experience dealing with farmers and ranchers who try to manage every single aspect of their operation from production of course, but also the accounting, the bookkeeping, the marketing, the sales. And generally what happens is that all of these operations suffer. And so she had the idea to put together a team of folks who are experts in business and finance and marketing to take the burden off the farmer, be able to improve their quality of life and, and the products that they're producing. Um, you'll notice that I'm not pictured here. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about me. I'm a sixth generation to take care of this land in the West Central Piedmont region of Georgia. I spent over a decade um, direct marketing my grass-fed beef, and I used equip grants mostly to build out the infrastructure for a management-intensive rotational grazing operation. So equip grants funded uh, 12 miles of barbed wire fence, heavy use water areas, stream crossing, solar wells, mile and a quarter water line, overseeding a bunch of legumes, uh, but after a good solid decade of this, I started looking for work that was a little easier on my back. Uh, <laughs> so a few years ago, I started teaching agribusiness at Georgia Technical College, and then transitioned to uh, helping farmers and ranchers get funding for their operation, and applying for grants, and administering. And through sheer dumb luck, my timing was impeccable because <laughs> this is the best time that we've seen generations to, to search out and find government grant funds. As Ted and his team mentioned, the, the Inflation Reduction Act has completely changed the funding landscape. They've injected a tremendous amount of capital across the board in, in old programs like, um, you know, over 19 billion allocated to the NRCS. Of that, 8.45 to equip. Um, all these programs that they were mentioning, RCPP, CSP, ACEP, they've all had this huge influx of, of funding. Um, so what this means is that now is the best time to, to seek this out and to find it. So what are the biggest opportunities for ranchers? As Ted and his team mentioned, NRCS is the first stop. And if you haven't befriended your local NRCS agent, you should start there. Because they are a great resource. They want to help. They have lots of ability to help you in your operation. Um, but there are lots of um, new USDA programs, as well as different iterations of old programs. So there's been a bunch of money um, allotted for meat and poultry processing uh, expansions. There's been money put into Rural Energy for America program to, to fund solar panels and other re renewable energy sources to put on the farm. Also, the rural business development. Uh, moving away from, from government funding, there's also private grants, and there's a lot of companies that do this. Nature Conservancy and Green Spaces Alliance are, are a couple of those, and of course what brings us all here is carbon credits. <laughs> uh, we've learned a lot about that already. So how do these programs work? And I want to caveat this by saying eligibility requirements change a lot. So don't let these, these ones at the top deter you. Um, a lot of these are for, specifically for NRCS programs. So, um, they are directed towards these, but these aren't necessarily deal breakers. But all these programs, what they generally are gonna cover, they're gonna provide funding for 
uh, infrastructure to address environmental quality issues, infrastructure to increase efficiency and rural outreach, to improve management best practices, and also conservation easements. Uh, and, and there's a variety of ways that that can look. And you know, most every operation can find something in that list that would benefit their operation. Um, you could also find things in the list of that would benefit you that what they don't cover, which is generally buying land, buying buildings, buying vehicles and equipment. So, the advantages of these programs. There's a lot of money there. And it's money that you can use to improve your operation, to increase your profitability. Um, the challenges, as was mentioned, these are really complicated applications. There's a lot involved. Equip, uh, at least where I am, and it looks uh, very different than here in Montana, but. The EQIP program there, which is one of the simpler grant applications, it's got about 35 forms that you've got to fill out, and also a conservation plan that you have to build. Um, the, the, the programs change a lot. The eligibility rules, the priorities, the funding levels, all these things change. The farm bill to farm bill, um, year to year, state to state, county to county. Um, there's also Different places have uh, an inconsistent amount of government outreach. So a lot of times the onus is on the producer to reach out and, and do the groundwork to find the, the opportunities that are available and how to apply for them. So where a good act comes in is uh, we have built several tools to, to help with the complexity of this, this funding landscape. Uh, first and foremost, we have a grant database survey where it takes eight to 10 minutes. You enter basic information about your operation and you'll uh, receive the email back saying what programs you're eligible for. And also we can alert you when these programs are come online, have come online and when you can apply for funding. And then we can also help uh, um, help you do the application, help you administer the grant, help you brainstorm. There's a lot of different ways that that can look. Um, but in the end, we have a lot of value uh, that we can provide to all operations. So please reach out. You can go to thegoodagriculture.com and take the survey. Um, you can reach out to me, email, or phone. Of course, I'll be here, and I'm, I'm happy to talk further about ways that we can help your operation. Happy to take any questions now. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, so just to <laughs> open up the questions uh, for, for Ted and the, the NRCS folks, I was just kind of curious. Uh, you know, you mentioned kind of the TIP program, and it sounds like it's you know part of that long-term planning that you guys do. Would you guys still encourage ranchers to come to you if they have programs that are outside of the TIP structure? How often is that kind of evaluated, or is it pretty restrictive once the TIP is set that you know they should mainly apply for those? What's kind of the balance of things that are TIP and then non-TIP funded uh, in your guys' region? We, we always encourage people to come in and talk and, and, and apply. As Nate mentioned, the community ag program right now is a funding source for everyone. Uh, you just have to sell some products locally. Uh, it's probably more limited by the budget. I'm not sure quite how much we'll have for 2024, but it, it, there's a very good chance we could work with you in some fashion, at least conservation technical assistance. You know, and then as far as uh, Producers that are wanting to do something similar to, like, say, you know, we've got the tip going on in the Trail Creek area, but there's plenty of issues with conifer encroachment all over the county, all over the state for that matter. Uh, if we've got somebody who wants to do similar work and they're outside of that area, uh, that's where, you know, we, we really do encourage them to come to the office and talk to us or come to local worker meetings uh, so, you know, their voice can be heard uh, because that, that's what drives the, the tip writing process. Uh, so that long range plan was kind of developed, um, you know, with maybe 10, 15 years out in mind or something like that, but it's something that's uh, reevaluated annually. Um, so we kind of revisit that at every local work group meeting. We have one with uh, both groups uh, once a year. Um, and, you know, 
we can't really get a tip approved if we don't know that there's interest in participation. Uh, so we, you know, that's where uh, folks just come to the office or come to the, the work group meetings and let us know. And, and sorry, how frequently and when are the work group meetings? Just for everyone. It's uh, it's different for both groups. Actually, uh, typically it's you know early year, like what was last year. They were both in February or something like that. So it, it's subject to change, but that's again just uh, stop by the office or give us a call. And uh, as soon as we know, that's set by the conservation district, and we you know we can let folks uh, know when those are and where they'll be. And then just a, a question for Josh. Um, I'm just curious in your experience, where typically do do farmers or ranchers? fail in their grant process? Are there kind of common mistakes you see or difficulties, whether it's getting their product declined or whether they don't fully finish it? What What is the kind of the most common paths or, or errors you see on your side? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think that the, the, the most consistent thing, um, most consistent failures to, to not get started. I think that there are a lot of people out to help and, and help you through this process, be it NRCS or Good Ag or other companies. Um, they a lot of these programs look very different so there's not necessarily one consistent reason why the, these applications fail but the, the biggest issue is is not trying not, not getting started and, and putting in the application from the beginning great do we have any questions from the group Perfect. all right thank you so much folks